So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm going to hand you straight over to Nicole Yershin. Thank you, Mike. I'll pay you later for that. I'm going to sit here. I hope that's okay. I'll try and make it a little bit less formal. Um, okay. Nope, that's not me, is it? Ah, okay. So, as Mike said, I've been um, a traditional advertising chick, if you like, for 25 years. So, I wasn't born a digital native. So, um, my experience is, is literally come about from problems I've encountered and solutions I've then um, implemented to, to fix those problems. So, I was at GGT in the 80s um, with Dave Trott as he's kind of head of traffic, then at Simons Palmer in the 90s. And then I was asked by the Ogilvy chairman in 2000 to bring them into the 21st century. So, that's quite important because I was employed to do this. I was employed to be disruptive. It's very hard when organizations try and get someone who understands digital or, or, or is that kind of hunter mentality to get them to do the kind of things that I do as well as their day job. It, it just doesn't really happen. It's just too much that needs doing. So um, I'm going to skip through these quite quickly so we might have um, some time later for, for Q&A because I'm going to go through a few different problems I'd encountered and then solutions to try and fix it. So we have a lab that I set up about three years ago, um, but I actually have been working my way towards doing um, this kind of work for the last kind of eight years, um, I reckon. So it, it started out with, um, with doing semesters of learning, okay, which I'll, I'll take, I'm going to skip through these because they're quite wordy. Well, hold on that one. So semesters of learning. Um, when I first started seeing all these amazing things happening you know, with gaming and mobile and TiVo and I, and I was trying to say to Ogilvy, you know, what do you think the impacts of these things are going to have on our business and no one was really particularly interested in listening to me and they didn't really understand what I was saying. I, maybe it was that I wasn't eloquent enough at explaining my visions. So I had to prove by doing um, so that they would understand something tangible. So what I did was I, I started seeing all these different things happening in, um, you know, on the web and, and out there, and I started sharing it. And what started to happen when I shared it with Ogilvy, so there's 1,600 people in 10 group companies just in London, people would then email me back and say, stop spamming me. Um, so that was a good lesson in that not everyone cares. Um, some people like to do their day job and just get on with it, and some people like to have that entrepreneurial hunter mentality. So it meant that I needed to understand I couldn't just inflict my, the world is changing views on everyone. The other thing it, it did was it helped me understand that it needs to be much more focused learning. So I developed about eight years ago semesters of learning and it, it's um, a semester or a term, 12 to 20 weeks on one specific area. So my first one was streaming. And um, what I do within that semester is I, um, I see 10 to 15 different streaming companies every other week. So you start to understand good, bad, indifferent, who is doing you know, that kind of stuff in that area. I then will find um, a brand where streaming can fix a problem. So um, that happened to be Ford at the time, where a Ford chairman was speaking to his staff and to Ogilvy, and it was that big, and it was pixelated and buffering, and. Um, and I kind of felt, well, I just seen a company who could deliver full HD quality stream to your desktop like that. Why weren't we using it? So I introduced it then to Ford Team and Ford Client, which then gives us another revenue stream um, because we've never done internal comms before for Ford. So it's another revenue stream, and we then implement doing the stream for them. So, and it went to 22,000 desktops in 19 countries in five different languages. Once that then is implemented, and there are lots of no's along the way. So Ford um, IT, for instance, said, no, it's not going to happen. You're going to tear down our servers. Every no that you come up against, you have to then knock it down because all these things are brand new. And the first thing that anyone will say is, I don't know whether we can do it. That's why it's so important to find the right partnerships. So you trust in someone. And there's uh, the Kanura guys here did a really beautiful job for me. Um, it, last September, and it was to trust in them to do three live streams at the same time, um, filming bands. 
And it was knowing that I had 86 countries watching and 15,000 people and not to be let down. So the partnerships and, and seeing all those companies every semester is very, very important. And then at the end of the semester, we have these lab days. So there's a couple of examples up on the board. And these lab days are um, where we bring uh, all the people that we've met to exhibit all day. Um, and then we have speakers in the morning and then in, um, throughout the whole day we have our clients come in and employees and that's where we share the learning um, in, in, a, in a kind of a, a lab day. So we've done about nine or ten of them. So our two semesters this year are retail, store of the future, shopper of the future and um, storytelling will probably be for, next, for this September. Okay, so if I go, um, if I go back one. So in understanding the lab, I know this is quite complicated, but I, I set up a hub and spoke model. So the hub is, is the, the, the physical space of where all of the kit is housed at Ogilvy. So it's a space where you can have a look at augmented reality, what's happening on tablets, um, auto stereoscopic um, TV screens and content, um, eye tracking, kinetic time, type, type of gaming, that's the place where people touch and feel and you can seed ideas. Well, they'll walk around and you can say, oh, you could, have you thought about doing that with your campaign? Or, so we're not saying anything is dead, we're just having people touch and feel and understand this technology. And it also helps that I don't have to keep explaining what an interactive floor projection is because they can see it. And then you can start working out when they're looking at it, all the possibilities of what you can do with it. So there is a physical hub in the middle and then you have all of these different spokes that come out, out um, throughout that hub. One of them is, is creative, which I, I just gave an example of. One of them is um, um, semesters of learning. One of them is lab days and lab lunches and show and tell. So it all starts to come together. And I'll go through different examples of, of these different um, uh, spokes. So as I mentioned, our um, kind of our, our partnership book um, so I've, I've put, put at the top, can you see, uh, who out there is good, bad, indifferent? So the solution was the semesters of learning to actually find out and see all those people. And it, it takes time. What I've done doesn't happen overnight. This has been about seven, eight years of, of doing these semesters to have an understanding, and it's always changing. Um, the other problem is that um, in, within Ogilvy, they only knew really TV and print. So all of these other things that were going on, they only had a department for TV and print. In fact, all the P&Ls and how they're paid, um, it, it's, it, the lab um, starts to become media um, and discipline and technolo technology agnostic. Because when you are, say, Ogilvy Advertising, you are paid by doing a 30-second TV ad. So therefore, that is what you, would, you will give um, as a, a solution to a problem. When actually now, maybe it might be the solution would be a social media campaign. And maybe TV taps into the back end of that. So it's, it's, it's kind of disrupting that whole um, status quo. Um, and then how do you implement all of these new things? So I just mentioned to you with uh, having the right partnerships. So I'm going to give you a few examples of how, and I'll talk you through, I'll play a little bit of the film and I'll, I'll talk over it and explain how you do that. Following is a film to instruct you in the use of the Fanta Stealth Sound System. So what is the Stealth Sound System? The Stealth Sound System uses sound waves that most adults can't so hear. this was a most creative team when I was doing my mobile semester to loud things who came to me and said they had a weird idea about the sound. To make it work, and it was sound that only kids could hear, but adults couldn't. And they used, it usually use it to get your kids away from street phone. corners. Then and so the um, I phoned up phone. a guy who I'd met Keep about five this, years earlier at an event, a really random event. Kept his name and now number in my black book. So we have this you can digital use black book yes now. To say and phoned him up. Yes he came someone? in. We sat round a table use, no. and we worked out actually this idea could yes. work um, for Fanta using in a disruptive uncool play sound, way for you kids to communicate with each other with this mosquito sound and adults couldn't hear it. So um, he cool. went away for eight weeks. I gave him some lab money, and I'll talk to you about how I got money into my lab the in a minute, because it's not given be to me by in serious It's a very different R&D part. Like if a huge and he came back after eight weeks and said, I have the most amazing 
sound that's, that's going to be on every single handset. Um, and then it goes the into the linear model and of the two creatives, the account man sells it into the client and the, the mobile producer makes it. So there's this whole non-linear thing that has been done beforehand that mother. always needs to be celebrated because it doesn't just magically happen in that they've just got an idea and they know it's going to work. Serious risk. You may acquire new eh? friends and meet people you never dreamt so of. So that's one loads and loads of awards for the agency. So that's the other thing that's quite difficult with doing this job. It's quite hard to measure success. Um, it's very easy for Ogilvy to measure success in income coming in and new business coming in. But when you're doing the things that I'm doing, it's, it's, it's not something that is um, you know, easy to measure. Um, and this came Wimble. about from uh, augmented reality. The, the problem the semester of learning a lucky few get to watch the big matches live. This year, we decided to help thousands of other fans do the same. Our solution? To let them see through walls by developing an app that let them do just that. So this was done in June 08, 09, before any augmented reality company really The first really augmented hit reality the app layer had no data up yet. And made it better. And um, it was trying now it with a client that was brave any of the main to just see and watch all the action live. And put measurement of the app was loaded with other features VR. too. There was live video, so the public so what happened was when you were at Wimbledon and you had your phone as you panned around, you could see that there were strawberries for sale over there, big queue at the ladies' loo over there. Once we knew it worked that year, the following year we went bigger and better, bigger budgets, not so much of a... Um, so the first year, the budgets were 80-20 split, 80% on their usual tried and tested, but 20% on um, doing this. The following year, it was a much more even split. And we actually did a, a live feed with the BBC so that when you were standing outside court one and you turned your phone round, you could then, and heard a cheer go up, you could then see a live feed of the match. So almost you were looking through walls. Um, so there's a lot of experimentation. It takes a brave client and an understanding the technology um, to be able to put something like this together. And then this is an example of 3D mapping projection. Um, and again, this was from a semester of learning that we did with um, Digital Out of Home. And one of the lab lunches that we had was a company called SEPA coming in. Um, it just so happens that someone who was working on Ford was inspired by what he'd seen with this mapping projection. And then I worked with them closely and the handhold the traditional creative team, account team, planners, on them managing this and making it happen. I am not a department, I'm a, I, I, this is how I set change within the agencies, I make them do it. And it's uncomfortable for them because they've never done it before. So that was a, a real guy climbing, it was, um, this is a 3D map projection. And again, these things we've not done before, and certainly not an interactive one where they can um, you know, uh, do holes in the wall and have the wall fall out onto it. And then with this event, we then attach social media to it, and then we attach mobile to it because people are there with their phones. And then now, all of a sudden, the traditional ad agency team that only does TV and press now do, did a, um, offer their client a fully interactive projection and with a social media campaign and a mobile campaign. So they, now that is their future. Now continuously offer those kind of things. And then this is what we did recently, last year, with Frago, um, and it was from our data visualisation, semester of learning, again attaching it to a client. This worked in a different way, this worked purely on a partnership level. So it was using Greywell to do the um, taste visualisation of the ice cream, Frago ice cream, so that you could see what taste looked like you know, um, visually. So that you put in all the different taste frequencies into a, um, a system and then you came up out with digital art that was then exhibited in a gallery at the London Chocolate Factory. So what happened was the client then was starting to think, oh, I don't know about this and you know, it, it, it's not really the kind of thing that I would ordinarily do. So I, rather than um, them thinking they were going to not make it happen, I went to Clear Channel, who uh, I'd built a partnership with, I managed to work with them for all of their digital signage around London. Labs paid for the signage to be done in-house. And then I said to um, the Frago client, you can't not get involved in this because it's going to be plastered everywhere. 
Um, so they then said, OK, fine, we'll do this gallery at um, Chocolate Factory. And it was just the most brilliant success. And it, the footfall that they um, increased to the ice cream shop was enormous. In the, um, I think it was an uplift of like 310%. So it wasn't just doing it for that art gallery, it was then being able to share it, email it, and use social media. They're the kind of the examples of, of what we're doing, the, the creative inspiration that comes out of the semesters. They're always attached to not just learning, but they must be attached to um, business. And then what starts to happen is the lab starts to come away from it being lab and techie. It actually is, is more about business. And it takes it back to basics of what's the problem and then finding the right solution. If you don't know the solutions that are out there, then it's quite hard to fix a problem. We also have six labs around the world, so we're continuously talking every month. Um, so there's one in Tokyo, Beijing, Sao Paulo, Singapore, New York, and London. So we're constantly sharing um, knowledge, which is, I can't tell you how um, invaluable that is to hook up with your other, you know, not see them as competitors, but see them as, as knowledge sharing and, and being able to, to harness that. And then, you know, the, the lab then starts to be used much more for new business, getting clients through the door. Um, we recently did a pitch for BA and just won it where we used augmented reality, where, one, where our CEO couldn't attend the pitch. because She wanted other people there, but yet we, we had her as an augmented reality, uh, like a, you know, a Princess Leah pop up in, um, in kind of augmented reality format from the iPad. So, and then with another one, we've, we've had someone as a hologram. So there's other ways in which to engage and, um, and bring something to life. So going back to the fact that Ogilvy don't, um, obviously they, they pay my salary and it's amazing that they've allowed me to be disruptive in, in that kind of environment. But um, when I was first looking to do the lab, I saw Rory Sutherland speaking and I thought that guy should just get paid to talk. Um, so I noticed that he'd, he'd be my first revenue um, stream for my lab to allow me to have this pot that I could experiment with. Because what happens with R&D, you know, as I've put, um, it, you don't get money from um, most companies for R&D. It is the hardest thing to get money for. But if I'm making money myself, it then means that I don't need to ask for permission. I don't need to ask for money. Any lovely ideas I can actually then make happen rather than um, be told, no, I'm sorry, you can't do it. So Rory was the first kind of income for the lab. So every time he speaks, I act as his agent. Um, and then we start to then go into, I then have a brand with Rory, and then we start to deliver a product. So another spoke for um, the lab is this Inspire thing. So we went on a tour around Silicon Roundabout. We've done two so far. We've got a third one um, that's going to be happening. And it's seeing all of the um, companies that are on our doorstep, engaging with them, chatting about any kind of potential problems, real kind of collaboration. One of the companies I saw was a company called It's Nice That. And I, I, again, I have to attach something physical to just going and seeing random companies. So what came out of that was being able to do a book for Rory. So it was engaging with this company. It also allowed for me to be a publisher myself. Not that I'd ever published a book before in my life, but I published this book. So all the money that now comes in, comes in directly to the lab. So it, it, it's almost kind of, a, it's a bit of a two fingers up to the publishing industry to say to them, I'm disrupting you and I'm going to do it myself because I can. Um, and it's just trialing all these different things. So we, we have Rory's book now, and that came about as a, a direct result from seeing different companies in Silicon Roundabout, building a partnership with them. And now the next iteration of that, now the book sales are coming in, is being able then to act like a new age marketing agency and do content continuously, not just a one ad with a big spike and then not see anyone again, or just a, you know, a social media campaign. This is going to have regular pieces of content for the next seven months continuously being shipped out um, and then monitored and worked out what works and what doesn't work. 
So it's, it's again, I can't stress, it's making sure that we um, attach any kind of learning or inspiration to something physical uh, and business. Idea Shop is something that was um, set up by a lady called Ruth Jamison, and that is, if Ogilvy were a shop, what would they sell? So it, it started off at Brixton Market, where um, we used the Brixton community. Anyone that had any issues, any problems, wanted expertise, and we give our ideas away for free for 90 minutes for each, um, each person that comes in. And it, we've done now four of these. There's another one that's going to be happening at Marketing Week in May. But re and everyone kind of gets involved, the lab gets involved. This is Ogilvy. Um, there's a, a girl there who works within planning called Tara Austin, and she's set up a group that looks purely at music. This is, again, this is a passion. She's doing this on top of her day job. It's finding those kind of people. Um, and the third one, Turing Breaks, actually, that was when I got the idea to do a live um, webcast, a, a, a live stream from, from this concert. So, and I found a company, because I was doing a music semester of learning, I found a company who I knew would be good for food because they were looking to do something called Bands in Transit. And so I thought, okay, I'll trial them out. They live streamed Touring Breaks concert and it, it went down brilliantly, which then gave me an idea for our actual lab day for music that we just had it last September. We had speakers speaking in the morning, exhibitors exhibiting throughout the whole um, day. But in the afternoon, we had three music publishing companies all have a stage at Ogilvy. We turned Ogilvy into a Glastonbury festival and we had every single stage live streamed simultaneously to one website, which is the Kanura guys did that. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and it was a brilliant success, seen by 15,000 people, 86 countries. Now, again, that's showing just how Labs pushes it forward because I had sleepless nights over that thinking, why did I agree to doing three live stages? Why not just one? But you have to keep pushing it because even though it's not been done before, it doesn't mean to say it can't be done. Um, then there's a whole kind of educational piece within the Lab because I was fed up with the, the usual um, Oxbridge educated people always coming in so therefore, we were just um, employing people that were like ourselves, no diversity, no ethnic mix. So I set up something called the rough diamond. So it's kind of a diamond shape, and you have Ideas Foundation at the bottom that deal with all schools in Hackney and Tower Hamlets, so age 14 to 18. Labs gives them money. And you have at the other side of the diamond, School Communication Arts. Um, Labs gives them money. And then you have Ravensbourne. So we have an Ogilvy University with Ravensbourne. And so that, what that starts to do is it starts to mean that kids in Hackney and Town Hamlets who automatically think their next job's going to be Tesco's checkout, it allows for them to come in, we give them live briefs, they work with us, um, and it opens their eyes to a whole industry that they knew nothing about. It then allows them either going via School Communication Arts or uh, Ravensbourne to then come into Ogilvy. So Ravensbourne University that I set up with Chris Thompson probably about four years ago means that we speed date about 30 to 40 second year students across every single course. Fashion, lighting, broadcast, 3D, animation. And then they work with us, they come in, we handpick five of them to come in throughout the whole summer. They then go back to school in the October. The deal is they teach their peers and, and their teachers all of their learning, because I wasn't convinced that the teachers knew what it was like in the workplace. And then they um, come back to us at Christmas, come back to us at Easter, and then we look to employ. So we set with a, an, un, an idea of convergence of creativity is that the first person we employed was a lighting technician, which proved my point in that not in a million years would Ogilvy have ever hired a lighting technician. And she would never have looked at coming to an ad agency. So it starts to look at a very different mix. Um, we hired someone who now works in the new business department, who's a graphic artist, who the creative couldn't see what she was doing that was so amazing. But yet, from a new business point of view, it meant not doing PowerPoint presentations anymore and starting to creatively look at um, you know, presenting in a very different way. So it, it's finding different jobs, different skill sets, and um, starting to get them in from a very early age. And then once they're in at Ogilvy, then the top one is Marketing Academy. And that's where they are then mentored um, by top CEOs in the country or CMOs in the country, and it's a great uh, mentorship scheme. Um, so that's kind of my rough diamond. So that's 
another part of um, the disruptiveness of, of labs. And then we do lots of, um, kind of workshops. And these workshops um, are, can either be much more strategic or much more um, you know, idea generation and, and have loads and loads of ideas that come out of them. But what they're done is they're facilitated by a partner. They're not facilitated by Ogilvy, which keeps it totally agnostic in terms of discipline, media, technology, and it really does fix um, a, a problem with the right solution. And then this is something that we did for Unilever. Welcome to Unilever Media Lab at 100 Victoria Embankment. Um, this physical space, this room is put together to give the brand development community a consumer experience of uh, some of the new media technologies. So Lab this in a Box, as you can see, was something that this I branded up for Unilever, the where they take today. all of the learnings of everything that I do within our lab, touch and the hub and the spoke, and, and they can just hand many pick of the devices what will work for them. So we're not what they needed was many of our um, a, a hub use every with day. constant changing of the Some of our um, own barriers come from within. And an element of semesters of learning. Doesn't allow you um, to have the same. But then other clients might want um, something totally. They might want the inspired bit. Other clients might want something totally different. Every piece of technology you, know, totally you see different. here represents this an opportunity was, um, for innovative communication. This was the first hologram we did when we set this up brand um, of Simon Cliff, the, the then CMO. Or knowledge um, we had of, his head like an Obi Wan Kenobi hanging in the brand in the middle of the room, so that when staff came in and were introduced to the lab, and you know, high definition content obviously is becoming. And then this is what we've been doing in the labs around the world for the last kind of year or so. Um, what we call now system.
that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks very much, Nicole. We've probably got time for a couple of questions, if anybody's got anything they want to, to ask. Yes, gentlemen here in the flowery shirt and hat. Hi, um, oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Matthew Lindley. I'm general manager at Eastern Angles. I wanted to ask, could we come and visit the lab? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I do I do, do um, tours of the lab. I mean, at the moment, it was just used for a, a BA pitch, so we're just in the process of, of uh, housing it somewhere else. But, yeah, on occasions, we do do tours for outside. Because quite often, that's where we can get revenues where some companies want us to develop a lab-in-a-box solution. Right, thank you. Right, there was a question over there. So, gentlemen there, if you hang on to the microphone. Uh, my question is, uh, do you have any mentorship for uh, new labs or new spaces who wants to go towards your direction? Sorry, say that again. Uh, if you have any, if you do mentorships, if you can uh, yeah, mentor new companies, new labs no, going towards your direction. We, it doesn't operate, it operates really just solely for Ogilvy and the group. So, as I mentioned, there's 10 group companies um, that all specialise in, you know, Ogilvy PR, Ogilvy advertising, Ogilvy activation, and there's 1,600 people. So, it pretty much just copes with um, work for the group rather than uh, open it up for memberships. The gentleman there. Hello. Um, obviously, technology moves at a frightening pace. And so, how do you balance the, you know, something... We Okay, you could never, the worst thing is to be right at the wrong time. So when is the technology ripe for exploitation? What, what stage do you jump in? I think it depends on what your problem is. So with, with IBM, it wasn't about they wanted loads of people to experience that. Because at the time, we, when we did that augmented reality thing at Wimbledon, we only trialled it on um, Android that had only just come out. We didn't do it on iPhone. So therefore, the, everything revolved around the measurement of success was all to do with the PR. Therefore, IBM want to be seen to be using that kind of technology. So therefore, they're happy that not everyone is using it because it was literally, it was just when Android came out, but they wanted to be seen to be utilizing such high technology. This kind of depends on what a client wants. There's certain clients that, um, that work better in that space. But Fanta, you know, when we did the, um, the Fanta Stealth, that, I think we stopped counting at the millionth download. Okay, um, I'm afraid we're going to have to stop questions there because we're, uh, we're running to a fairly tight timetable. But, um, Nicole, are you going to be around in the coffee break? Yeah, yeah, be around. So, Nicole will be around in the coffee break if anybody wants to catch her and, and, uh, and chat to us some more. Nicole Yershin, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.